Chapter Seven of the Czar's Spy by William Le Coeur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Contains a surprise. The first object brought to light, about two feet beneath the surface, was a piece of dark grey woollen stuff, which, when the mould was removed, proved to be part of a woman's skirt. With frantic eagerness, I got into the hole we had made and removed the soil with my hands until I suddenly touched something hard. A body lay there, doubled up and crushed into the well-like hole the men had dug. Together we pulled it out, when, to my surprise, on wiping away the dirt from the hard waxen features, I recognized it as the body of Armida, the woman who had been my servant in Leghorn and who had afterwards married Olinto. Both had been assassinated. When Muriel gazed upon the dead woman's face, she gave vent to an expression of surprise. The body was evidently not that of the person she had expected to find. "'Who is she, I wonder?' my companion ejaculated. "'Not a lady, evidently, by her dress and hands.' "'Evidently not,' was my response, for I still deemed it best to keep my own counsel. I recollected the story Olinto had told me about his wife of her illness and her longing to return to Italy. Yet the dead woman's countenance must have been healthy enough in life, although her hands were rough and hard, showing that she had been doing manual labour. Armida had been a particularly good housemaid, a black-haired, black-eyed Tuscan, quick, cleanly, and full of a keen sense of humour. It was a great shock to me to find her lying there dead, the breast of her dress was stained with dried blood, which on examination I found had issued from a deep and fatal wound beneath the ear where she had been struck an unerring blow that had severed the artery. "'Those men, those men who buried her, I wonder who they were,' my companion exclaimed in a hushed voice. "'We must follow them and ascertain. They are certainly the murderers who have returned in secret and concealed the evidence of this second crime. Yes, I said, let us go after them. They must not escape us. Then, leaving the exhumed body beneath a tree, I caught Muriel by the waist and waded across the deep channel worn by the stream at that point, after which we both ascended the steep bank where the pair had disappeared in the darkness of the wood. I blamed myself a thousand times for not following them, yet my suspicions had not been aroused until after they had disappeared. The back of the man in a snuff-coloured suit was, she felt confident, familiar to her. She repeated what she had already told me, yet she could not remember where she had seen a similar figure before. We went on through the gloomy forest, for the light had faded and evening was now creeping on. From time to time we halted and listened, but there was a dead silence, broken only by the shrill cry of a night bird and the low rustling of the leaves in the autumn wind. The men knew their way, it seemed, even though the wood was trackless. Yet they had nearly twenty minutes start of us, and in that time they might be already out in the open country. Would they succeed in evading us? Yet even if they did, I could describe the dress of one of them while that of his companion was, as far as I made out, dark blue of a somewhat nautical cut. He wore also a flat cap with a peak. We went on, striking straight for the open moorland, which we knew bounded the woods in that direction, and before the light had entirely faded we found ourselves out amongst the heather with the distant hills looming dark against the horizon but we saw no sign of the men who had so secretly concealed the body of their victim. "'I will take you back to the castle, Miss Leithcourt,' I said, "'and then I'll drive on to Dumfries and see the police. These men must be arrested.' "'Yes, do,' she urged. "'I will get into the house by the stable-yard, for they must not see me in this terrible plight.' It was rough walking, therefore at my invitation she took my arm, and as she did so I felt that she was shivering. "'You are very wet,' I remarked. "'I hope you won't take cold.' "'Oh, I'm used to getting wet. I drive and cycle a lot, you know, and very often get drenched,' was her reply. Then after a pause she said, 
we must discover who that woman was she seems from her complexion and her hair to be a foreigner like the man uh, yes i think so was my reply i will tell the police all that we have found out and they will go there presently and recover the body if they can only find those two men then we should know the truth she declared one of them the one in brown was unusually broad-shouldered and seemed to walk with a slight stoop you expected to discover another woman did you not miss leithcourt i asked presently as we walked across the moor yes she answered i expected to find an entirely different person and if you had found her it would have proved the guilt of someone with whom you are acquainted she nodded in the affirmative then what we have found this evening does not convey to you the identity of the assassins no unfortunately it does not we must for the present leave the matter in the hands of the police but if the identity of the dead woman is established i asked it might furnish me with a clue she exclaimed quickly yes try and discover who she is who was the woman you expected to find a friend a very dear friend will you not tell me her name i inquired no it would be unfair to her she responded decisively an answer which to me was particularly tantalizing on we plodded in silence our thoughts too full for words was it not strange that the mysterious yachtsman should be her lover and stranger still that on recognizing me he should have escaped not only from scotland but away to the continent was not that in itself evidence of guilt and fear it was quite dark when i took leave of my bright little companion who tired out and yet uncomplaining pressed my hand and wished me good fortune in my investigations i shall await you to-morrow afternoon call and tell me everything won't you i promised and then she disappeared into the great stable-yard behind the castle while i went on down the dark road and then struck across the open fields to my uncle's house at half-past nine that night i pulled up the dog-cart before the chief police station in dumfries and alighting at once sought the big fair highlander mackenzie with whom i had had the consultation on the previous day when we were seated in his room beneath the hissing gas-jet i related my adventure and the result of my investigation what he cried jumping up you've unearthed another body a woman's i have and what is more i can identify her i replied her name is armida and she was the wife of the murdered man olinto santini then both husband and wife were killed without a doubt a double tragedy but the two men who concealed the body will you describe them i did so and he wrote at my dictation afterwards remarking we must find them and calling in one of his sub-inspectors he gave him instructions for the immediate circulation of the description to all the police stations in the county saying the two men were wanted on a charge of willful murder when the official had gone out again and we were alone mackenzie turned to me and asked what induced you to search the wood why did you suspect a second crime his question nonplussed me for a moment well you see i had identified the young man olinto and knowing him to be married and devoted to his wife i suspected that she had accompanied him here it was entirely a vague surmise i wondered whether if the poor fellow had fallen a victim to his enemies she had not also been struck down his lips were pressed together in distinct dissatisfaction i knew my explanation to be a very lame one but at all hazards i could not import muriel's name into the affair i had given her my promise and i intended to keep it then the body is still in the glen where you left it yes if you wish i will take you to the spot i can drive you and your assistant up there certainly let us go he exclaimed rising at once and ringing his bell get three good lanterns and some matches and put them in this gentleman's trap outside he said to the constable who answered his summons 
and tell Gilbert Campbell that I want him to go with me up to Rannoch Wood. Yes, sir, answered the man, and the door again closed. It's a pity, a thousand pities, Mr. Gregg, that you didn't stop those two men who buried the body. They were already across the stream and disappearing into the thicket before I mounted the rock, I explained. Besides, at the moment I had no suspicion of what they had been doing. I believed them to be stragglers from a neighbouring shooting party who had lost their way. Ah, most unfortunate, he said. I hope they don't escape us. If they're foreigners, they are not likely to get away. But if they're English or Scots, then I fear there's but little chance of us coming up with them. Yesterday at the inquest the identity of the murdered man was strictly preserved, and the inquiry was adjourned for a fortnight. "'Of course my name was not mentioned,' I said. "'Of course not,' was the detective's reply. Then he asked, "'When do you expect to get a telegram from your friend, the consul at Leghorn? I'm anxious for that, in order that we may commence inquiries in London.' "'The day after tomorrow, I hope. He will certainly reply at once, providing the dead man's father can still be found.' And at that moment, a tall, thin man, who proved to be Detective Campbell, entered, and five minutes later we were all three driving over the uneven cobbles of Dumfries and out into the darkness towards Rannoch. It was cloudy and starless, with a chill mist hanging over the valley, but my uncle's cob was a swift one, and we soon began to ascend the hill up past the castle and then, turning to the left, drove along a steep, rough by-road, which led to the south of the wood and out across the moor. When we reached the latter we all descended, and I led the horse, for owing to the many treacherous bogs it was unsafe to drive further. So, with Mackenzie and Campbell carrying lanterns, we walked on carefully, skirting the wood for nearly a mile, until we came to the rough wall over which I had clambered with Muriel. I recognized the spot, and having tied up the cob, we all three plunged into the pitch darkness of the wood, keeping straight on in the direction of the glen, and halting every now and then to listen for the rippling of the stream. At last, with some difficulty, we discovered it, and searching along the bank with our three powerful lights, I presently detected the huge moss-grown boulder whereon I had stood when the pair of fugitives had disappeared. Look, I cried, there's the spot! and quickly we clambered down the steep bank, lowering ourselves by the branches of the trees, until we came to the water into which I waded, being followed closely by my two companions. On gaining the opposite side, I clambered up to the base of the boulder, and lowered my lantern to reveal to them the gruesome evidence of the second crime, but the next instant I cried, "'Why, it's gone!' "'Gone!' gasped the two men. "'Yes, it was here. Look, this is the hole where they buried it. But they evidently returned, and finding it exhumed, they've free taken possession of it and carried it away.' The two detectives gazed down to where I indicated, and then looked at each other without exchanging a word. As we stood there, dumbfounded at the disappearance of the body, the Highlander's quick glance caught something, and stooping he picked it up and examined the little object by the aid of his lantern. Within his palm I saw lying a tiny little gold cross, about an inch long, enameled in red, while in the center was a circular miniature of a kneeling saint, an elegant and beautifully executed little trinket which might have adorned a lady's bracelet. "'This is a pretty little thing,' remarked the detective. "'It may possibly lead us to something.' "'But, Mr. Gregg,' he added, turning to me, "'are you quite certain you left the body here?' certain i echoed why look at the hole i made you don't think i have any interest in leading you here on a fool's errand do you not at all he said apologetically only the whole affair seems so very inconceivable i mean that the men having once got rid of the evidence of their crime would hardly return to the spot and reobtain possession of it unless they watched me exhume it and feared the consequences if it fell into your hands i suggested of course they might have watched you from behind the trees, and when you had gone they came and carried it away somewhere else, he remarked dubiously. But even if they did, it must be in this wood. 
they would never risk carrying a body very far and here is surely the best place of concealment in the whole country the only thing remaining is to search the wood at daylight i suggested if the two men came back here during my absence they may still be on the watch in the vicinity most probably they are we must take every precaution he said decisively and then with our lanterns lowered we made an examination of the vicinity without however discovering anything else to furnish us with a clue while i had been absent the body of the unfortunate armida had disappeared a fact which knowing all that i did was doubly mysterious the pair had without doubt watched muriel and myself and as soon as we had gone they had returned and carried off the ghastly remains of the poor woman who had been so foully done to death but who were the men the fellow with the broad shoulders whom muriel recognized and the slim seafarer in his pilot coat and peaked cap the enigma each hour became more and more inscrutable at dawn mackenzie with four of his men made a thorough examination of the wood but although they continued until dusk they discovered nothing neither was anything heard of the mysterious seafarer and his companion in brown tweeds i called on muriel as arranged and explained how the body had so suddenly disappeared whereupon she stared at me pale-faced saying the assassins must have watched us they are aware then that we have knowledge of their crime of course i said ah she cried hoarsely then we are both in deadly peril peril of our own lives these people will hesitate at nothing both you and i are marked down by them without a doubt we must both be wary not to fall into any trap they may lay for us her very words seemed an admission that she was aware of the identity of the conspirators and yet she would give me no clue to them we went out and up the drive together to the kennels where her father a tall imposing figure in his shooting kit was giving orders to the keepers hello greg he cried merrily extending his hand you'll make one of a party to glen lee to-morrow won't you peyton and phillips are coming ten sharp here and the ladies are coming out to lunch with us thanks i said accepting with pleasure for by so doing i saw that i might be afforded an opportunity of being near muriel the fact that the assassins were aware of our knowledge seemed to have caused her the greatest apprehension lest evil should befall us then as we turned away to go back to the house leithcourt said to me you know all about the discovery up at the wood the other day horrible affair a young foreigner found murdered yes i've heard about it i responded and the police are worse than useless he declared with disgust they haven't discovered who the fellow is yet why if it had happened anywhere else but in scotland they'd have arrested the assassin before this he's an entire stranger i hear i remarked and then added you often go up to the wood of an evening after pigeons it's fortunate you weren't there that evening eh he glanced at me quickly with his brows slightly contracted as though he did not exactly comprehend me in an instant i saw that my remark had caused him quick apprehension yes he answered with a sickly smile which he intended should convey to me utter unconcern they might have suspected me it certainly is a disagreeable affair to happen on one's property i said still watching him narrowly and then muriel at his side managed with her feminine ingenuity to divert the conversation into a different channel next day i accompanied the party over to glenlee about five miles distant and at noon at a spot previously arranged we found the ladies awaiting us with luncheon spread under the trees as soon as we approached muriel came forward quickly handing me a telegram saying that it had been sent over by one of my uncle's grooms at the moment they were leaving the castle i tore it open eagerly and read its contents then turning to my companions said in as quiet a voice as i could command i must go up to london to-night whereat the men one and all expressed hope that i should soon return leithcourt's party were a friendly set and at heart i was sorry to leave scotland yet the telegram made it imperative for it was from frank hutcheson and leghorn and read made inquiries 
Olito Santini married your servant Armida, an Italian consulate general in London, about a year ago. They live 64B, Albany Road, Camberwell. He is employed waiter, Ferrari's restaurant, Westbourne Grove, British consulate, Leghorn. The lunch was a merry one, as shooting luncheons usually are, and while we ate, the keepers packed our morning bag, a considerable one, into the Perth cart in waiting. Then, when we could wander away alone together, I explained to Muriel that the reason of my sudden journey to London was in order to continue my investigations regarding the mysterious affair. This puzzled her, for I had not, of course, revealed to her that I had identified Olinto. Yet I managed to make such excuses and promises to return that I think I allayed all her suspicions, and that night, after calling upon the detective Mackenzie, I took the sleeping car express to Euston. The restaurant which Hutchison had indicated was, I found, situated about halfway up Westburn Grove, nearly opposite Whiteley's, a small place where confectionery and sweets were displayed in the window, together with long-necked flasks of Italian chiati, chump chops, small joints, and tomatoes. It was soon after nine o'clock when I entered the long shop with its rows of marble-topped tables and greasy lounges of red plush. An unhealthy-looking lad was sweeping out the place with wet sawdust, and a big, dark-bearded, flabby-faced man in shirt-sleeves stood behind the small counter, polishing some forks. "'I wish to see Signor Ferrari,' I said, addressing him. "'There is no Ferrari. He is dead.' responded the man in broken english my name is odinsov i bought the place from madame you are russian i presume polish monsieur from Varsovi. i had seen from the first moment we had met that he was no italian he was too bulky and his face too broad and flat i have come to inquire after a waiter you have in your service an italian named santini he was my servant for some years, and I naturally take an interest in him. Santini, he repeated. Oh, you mean Olinto. He is not here yet. He comes at ten o'clock. This reply surprised me. I had expected the restaurant keeper to express regret at his disappearance, yet he spoke as though he had been at work as usual on the previous day. May I have a liqueur brandy? I asked seeing that i would be compelled to take something perhaps you will have one with me ach no but a cumul yes i will have a cumul and he filled our glasses and tossed off his own at a single gulp smacking his lips after it for the average russian dearly loves his national decoction of caraway seeds you find olinto a good servant i suppose i said for want of something else to say excellent the Italians are the best waiters in the world. I am Russian, but dare not employ a Russian waiter. These English would not come to my shop if I did. I looked around, and it struck me that the trade of the place mainly consisted in chops and steaks, for chance customers at midday, and tea and cake for those swarms of women who each afternoon buzz around that long line of windows of the world's provider. I could see that his was a cheap trade, as revealed by the printed notice stuck upon one of the long, fly-blown mirrors. Ices, fourpence, and sixpence. "'How long has Olinto been with you?' I inquired. "'About a year, perhaps a little more. I trust him implicitly, and I leave him in charge when I go away for holidays. He does not get along very well with the cook, who is Milanese. These Italians from different provinces always quarrel,' he added, laughing. If you live in Italy, you know that, no doubt. I laughed in chorus, and then glancing at my watch said, I'll wait for him if he will be here at ten. I'd much like to see him again. The Russian was by no means nonplussed, but merely remarked, He is late sometimes, but not often. He lives on the other side of London, over at Camberwell. His confidence that the waiter would return struck me as extremely curious. Nevertheless, I possessed myself in patience, strolled up and down the restaurant, and then stood watching the traffic in the grove outside. The man Odinsov seemed a quick, hard-working fellow, with a keen eye to business, 
for he fell to polishing the top of the marble tables with pail and brush, at the same time directing the work of the pallid-looking youth. Suddenly a side-door opened, and the cook put his head in to speak with his master in French. He was a typical Italian, about forty, with dark moustaches turned upwards and an easy-going, careless manner. Seeing me, however, and believing me to be a customer, he turned and closed the door quickly. In that instant I noticed the high broadness of his shoulders, and his back struck me as strangely similar to that of the man in brown whom we had seen disappearing in Rannoch Wood. The suspicion held me breathless. Was this Russian endeavouring to deceive me when he declared that Olinto would arrive in a few minutes? It seemed curious, for the man now dead must, I reflected, have been away at least four days. Surely his absence from work had caused the proprietor considerable inconvenience. "'That was your cook, wasn't it? The Milanese who was quarrelsome?' I laughed, when the side door has closed. "'Yes, monsieur. But Emilio is a very good workman, and very honest, even though I had constantly to complain that he uses too much oil in his cooking. These English do not like the oil.' I stood in the doorway again, watching the busy throng passing outside towards Royal Oak. Ten o'clock struck from a neighbouring church, and I still waited, knowing only too well that I waited in vain for a man whose body had already been committed to the grave outside that far-away old Scotch town. But I waited in order to ascertain the motive of the bearded Russian in leading me to believe that the young fellow would really return. Presently Odinsov went outside, carrying with him two boards, upon which the menu of the eight-penny luncheon this day was written in scrawly characters, and proceeded to affix them to the shop-front. This was my opportunity, and quick as thought, I moved towards where the unhealthy youth was at work, and whispered, "'I'll give you half a sovereign if you'll answer my questions truthfully. Now tell me, was the cook the man I've just seen here yesterday? Yes, sir. Was he here the day before? No, sir. He's been away ill for four days. And your master? He's been away too, sir. I had no time to put any further question, for the Russian re-entered at that moment, and the youth busied himself rubbing the front of the counter in pretense that I had not spoken to him. Indeed, I had some difficulty in slipping the promised coin into his hand at a moment when his master was not looking. Then I paced up and down the restaurant, waiting patiently and wondering whether the absence of Emilio had any connection with the tragedy up in Rannoch Wood. While I stood there, a rather thin, respectably dressed man entered, and seating himself upon one of the plush lounges at the further end, removed his bowler hat and ordered from the proprietor a chop and a pot of tea. Then taking a newspaper from his pocket, he settled himself to read, apparently oblivious to his surroundings. And yet, as I watched, I saw that over the top of his paper he was carefully taking in the general appearance of the place, and his eyes were keenly following the Russian's movements. The latter shouted, in French, the order for the chop through the speaking tube to the man Emilio, and then returning to his customer he spread out a napkin and placed a small cruet with knife, fork, and bread before him. But the customer seemed immersed in his paper, and never looked up until after the Russian's back was turned. Then so deep was his interest in the place, and so keen those dark eyes of his, that the truth suddenly dawned upon me. Mackenzie had telegraphed to Scotland Yard, and the customer sitting there was the detective who had come to investigate. I had advanced at the counter to chat again with the proprietor, when a quick step behind me caused me to turn. Before me stood the slim figure of a man in a straw hat and a rather seedy black jacket. "'Dio, signor padrone!' he cried. I staggered as though I had received a blow. Olinto Santini, in the flesh, smiling and well, stood there before me. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Tsar's Spy by William Lecoeur This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
life's counterclaim no words of mine can express my absolute and abject amazement when i faced the man whom i had seen lying cold and dead upon that grey stone slab in the mortuary at dumfries my eye caught the customer who on the entry of olinto had dropped his paper and sat staring at him in wonderment the detective had evidently been furnished with a photograph of the dead man and now like myself discovered him alive and living signor padrone cried the man whose appearance was so absolutely bewildering how did you find me i admit that i deceived you when i told you i worked at the milano he went on rapidly in italian but it was under compulsion my actions that night were not my own but those of others yes i understand i said but come out into the street i don't wish to speak before these people your padrone knows italian no doubt ah only a very little he answered smiling have no fear of him but there is emilio the cook then you have met him he exclaimed quickly with a strange look of apprehension he is an undesirable person signore so i gather i answered but i desire to speak to you outside not here and then turning with a smile to the pole i apologized for taking away his servant for a few minutes recollect i am his old master i added of course monsieur answered the pole bowing politely speak with him where and how long you will he is entirely at your service and when we were outside in Westburn Grove, Olinto walking by my side in wonderment, I asked suddenly, "'Tell me, have you ever been in Scotland, at Dumfries?' "'Never, signore, in my life. Why?' "'Answer me another question,' I said quickly. "'You married Armida at the Italian consulate. Where is she now? Where is she this morning?' He turned pale, and I saw a complete change in his countenance. Ah, signore, he responded, I only wish I could tell. It is entirely untrue that she is an invalid, I went on, or that you live in Lambeth. Your address is in Albany Road, Camberwell. You can't deny these facts. I do not deny them, signor commendatore. But how did you learn this? The authorities in Italy know everything, I answered. Like that of all your countrymen, your record is written down at the Comune. It is a clean one at any rate, signore, he declared with some slight warmth. I have a permesso to carry a revolver, which is in itself sufficient proof that I am a man of spotless character. I cast no reflection whatever upon you, Olinto, I answered. I have merely inquired after your wife, and you do not give me a direct reply. We had walked to the Royal Oak, and stood talking on the curb outside. "'I give you no reply, because I can't,' he said in Italian. "'Armida, my poor Armida, has left home.' "'Why did you tell me such a tale of distress regarding her?' "'As I have already explained, signore, I was not then master of my own actions. I was ruled by others, but I saved your life at the risk of my own.' Some day, when it is safe, I will reveal to you everything. Let us allow the past to remain, I said. Where is your wife now? He hesitated a moment, looking straight into my face. Well, signor commendatore, to tell the truth, she has disappeared. Disappeared, I echoed. And have you not made any report to the police? No. Why not? For reasons known only to myself, I did not wish the police to pry into my private affairs. I know, because you were once convicted at Lucca of using a knife, eh? I recollect quite well that affair. A love affair, was it not? Yes, signor commendatore, but I was a youth then, a mere boy. Then tell me the circumstances in which Armida has disappeared, I urged for I saw quite plainly that his sudden meeting with me had upset him, and that he was trying to hold back from me some story which he was bursting to tell. "'Well, signore,' he said at last, in a low tone of confidence, "'I don't like to trouble you with my private affairs after those untruths I told you when we last met.' 
Go on, I said. Tell me the truth. After the exciting incidents of our last meeting, I was half inclined to doubt him. The truth is, Signor Commendatore, that my wife has mysteriously disappeared. Last Saturday, at eleven o'clock, she was talking over the garden wall with a neighbor, and was then dressed to go out. She apparently went out, but from that moment no one has seen or heard of her. It was on the tip of my tongue to tell him the ghastly truth, yet so strange was the circumstance that his own double, even to the mole upon his face, should be lying dead and buried in Scotland, that I hesitated to relate what I knew. She spoke English, I suppose. She could make herself understood very well, he said with a sigh, and I saw a heavy, thoughtful look upon his brow. That he was really devoted to her, I knew. With the Italian of whatever station in life, love is all-consuming. It is either perfect love or genuine hatred. The Tuscan character is one of two extremes. I glanced across the road and saw the detective who had ordered his chop and coffee had stopped to light his pipe and was watching us. Have you any idea where your wife is or what has induced her to go away from home? Perhaps you had some words. Words, signore, he echoed. Why, we were the happiest pair in all London. No unkind word ever passed between us. There seems absolutely no reason whatever why she should go away without wishing me a word of farewell. But why haven't you told the police? For reasons that I have already stated, I prefer to make inquiries for myself. And in what have your inquiries resulted? Nothing, absolutely nothing, he said gravely. You do not suspect any plot? I recollect that night in Lambeth you told me that you had enemies. Ah, so I have, signore, and so have you, he exclaimed hoarsely. Yes, my poor Armida may have been entrapped by them. And if entrapped, what then? Then they would kill her with as little compunction as they would a fly, he said. Ah, you do not know the callousness of those people. I only hope and pray that she may have escaped and is hiding somewhere and will arrive unexpectedly and give me a startling surprise. She delights in startling me, he added with a laugh. Poor fellow, I thought, she would never again be able to startle him. She had actually fallen a victim just as he dreaded. Then you think she must have been called away from home by some urgent message, I suggested. By the manner in which she left things, it seemed as though she went away hurriedly. There were five sovereigns in a drawer that we had saved for the rent, and she took them with her. I paused again, hesitating whether to tell him the terrible truth. I recollected that the body had disappeared, therefore what proof had I of my allegation that she had been murdered? Tell me, Olinto, I said, as we moved forward again in the direction of Paddington Station. Have you any knowledge of a man named Leithcourt? He started suddenly and looked at me. I have heard of him, he answered very lamely. And of his daughter, Muriel? And also of her. But I am not acquainted with them, nor, to tell the truth, do I wish to be. Why? because they are enemies of mine, bitter enemies. His declaration was strange, for it threw some light upon the tragedy in Rannoch Wood. And of your wife also? I do not know that, he responded. My enemies are my wife's also, I suppose. You have not told me the secret of that dastardly attempt upon me when we last met, I said, in a low voice. Why not tell me the truth? I surely ought to know who my enemies really are, so as to be warned against any future plot. You shall know some day, signore. I dare not tell you now. You said that before, I exclaimed with dissatisfaction. If you are faithful to me, you ought at least to tell me the reason they wish to kill me in secret. Because they fear you, was his answer. Why should they fear me? but he shrugged his shoulders and made a gesture with his hands indicative of utter ignorance. I ask you one question. Answer yes or no. 
Is the man Leithcourt my enemy? The young Italian paused and then answered. He is not your friend. I am quite well aware of that. And his daughter? She is engaged, I hear. I think so. Where did you first meet Leithcourt? I have known him several years. When we first met he was poor. Suddenly became rich, eh? Bought a fine house in the country, lives mostly at the Carlton when he and his wife and daughter are in London, although I believe they now have a house somewhere in the West End, and he often makes long cruises on his steam yacht. And how did he make his money? Again Olinto elevated his shoulders without replying. If he would only betray to me the reason he had been induced to entice me to that house, I might then be able to form some conclusion regarding the tenants of Rannoch and their friends. Who was the man who, having represented the man now before me, had been struck dead by an unerring hand? Was it possible that Armida had been called by telegram to meet her husband, and recognizing the fraud perpetrated upon her, threatened to disclose it, and, for that reason, shared the same fate as the masquerader? This was the first theory that occurred to me, one which I believed to be the correct one. The motive was a mystery, yet the facts seemed to me plain enough. As the young Italian had refused to give any satisfactory explanation, I resolved within myself to wait until the unfortunate woman's body was recovered before revealing to him the ghastly truth. Without doubt he had some reason in withholding from me the true facts, either because he feared that I might become unduly alarmed, or else he himself had been deeply implicated in the plot. Of the two suggestions I was inclined to believe in the latter. He walked with me as far as the end of Bishop's Road, endeavouring with all the Italian's exquisite diplomacy to obtain from me what I knew concerning the Leith courts. But I told him nothing, nor did I reveal that I had only that morning returned from Scotland. Then at last we parted, and he retraced his steps to the little restaurant in Westburn Grove, while I entered a hansom and drove to the well-known photographers in New Bond Street, whose name had been upon the torn photograph of the young girl in the white piquet blouse, and her hair fastened with a bow of black ribbon, the picture that I had found on board the Lola on that memorable night in the Mediterranean, and a duplicate of which I had seen in Muriel's cosy little room up at Rannoch. I recollected that she had told me the name of the original was Elma Heath, and that she had been a schoolfellow of hers at Chichester. Therefore I inquired of the photographer's Lady Clark whether she could supply me with a print of that negative. For a considerable time she searched in her books for the name, and at last discovered it. Then she said, I regret, sir, that we can't give you a print, for the customer purchased the negative at the time. Ah, I'm very sorry for that, I said. To what address did you send it? The customer who ordered it was apparently a foreigner, she said, at the same time turning round the ledger so that I could read. And I saw that the entry was, Heath, Miss Elma, three dozen cabinets and negative. Address, Baron Xavier Auberg, Woznesensky Prospect, 48, St. Petersburg, Russia. Did this gentleman come with the young lady when her portrait was taken? I inquired. I can't tell, sir, she replied. I've only been here a year, and you see the date, over two years ago. The photographer would know, perhaps? He's a new man, sir. He came only a month ago. In fact, the business changed hands a year ago, and none of the previous employees have remained. Ah, that's unfortunate, I said, greatly disappointed, and having copied the address to which the negative and prints had been sent, I thanked her and left. Who, I wondered, was this Baron Oberg, and what relation was he to Elma Heath? The picture of the girl in the white blouse somehow exercised a strange attraction for me. Have you never experienced the fascination of a photograph, inexplicable and yet forcible, 
a kind of magnetism from which you cannot release yourself. Perhaps it was the curious fact that some person had taken it from its frame on board the Lola, and destroyed it that first aroused my interest, or it might have been the discovery of it in Muriel's room at Rannoch. Anyhow, it had for me an absorbing interest, for I often wondered whether the unknown girl who had secretly gone ashore from the yacht when I had left it was not Elma Heath herself. Who was this Baron Oberg? The name was German, undoubtedly, yet he lived in the Russian capital. From London to Petersburg is a far cry, yet I resolved that if it were necessary I would travel there and investigate. At the German embassy in Carlton House Terrace I found my friend Captain Nieverding, the second secretary, of whom I inquired whether the name of Baron Oberg was known. But having referred to a number of German books in His Excellency's library, he returned and told me that the name did not appear in the lists of the German nobility. "'He may be Russian, Polish, most probably,' added the captain, a tall, fair fellow in gold spectacles, whom I had known when he was third secretary of embassy at Rome. His opinion was that it was not a German name, for there was a little place called Oberg, he said, on the railway between Lodz and Lovich. Then, after luncheon, I went to Albany Road, one of those dreary, old-fashioned streets that were pleasant back in the early Victorian days, when Camberwell was a suburb and Walworth Common was still an open waste. I found the house where Olinto lived, a small, smoke-blackened, semi-detached place standing back from a tiny strip of weedy garden, with a wooden veranda before the first-floor windows. The house, according to the woman who kept a general shop at the corner, was occupied by two families. The Italians, as she termed them, lived above while the Gibbonses rented the ground floor. Oh, yes, sir, the foreigners are respectable enough. Always pays me ready money for everything except the milk. That they pays for weekly. I understand that the wife has disappeared. What have you heard about that? They do say, sir, that they had some words together the other day, and that the woman's took herself off in a tantrum. Only you can't believe all you hear, you know. Did they often quarrel? Not to my knowledge, sir. They were really very quiet, respectable persons for foreigners. I repassed the house of the dead woman, and then, regaining the busy Camberwell Road, I took an omnibus back to the Hotel Cecil in the Strand, where I had put up, tired and disappointed. Next day I ran down to Chichester, and after some difficulty found the Cheverton College for Ladies, a big old-fashioned house about half a mile out of town on the Drayton Road. The seminary was evidently a first-class one, for when I entered I noticed how well everything was kept. To the principal, an elderly lady of a somewhat severe aspect, I said, I regret, madam, to trouble you, but I am in search of information you can supply. It is with regard to a certain Elma Heath, whom you had as a pupil here, and who left, I believe, about two years ago. Her parents lived in Durham. I remember her perfectly, was the woman's response, as she sat behind the big desk, having apparently at first expected that I had a daughter to put to school. Well, I said, there's been some little friction in the family, and I am making inquiries on behalf of another branch of it, an aunt who desires to ascertain the girl's whereabouts. Ah, uh, I regret, sir, that I cannot tell you that. The baron, her uncle, came here one day, and took her away suddenly, abroad, I think. Had she no school friend to whom she would probably write? There was a girl named Leithcourt, Muriel Leithcourt, who was her friend, but who was also left. And no one else, I asked. Girls often write to each other after leaving school, until they get married, and then the correspondence usually ceases. The principal was silent and reflective. Well, she said at last, there was another pupil who was also on friendly terms with Elma, a girl named Lydia Morton. She may have written to her. If you really desire to know, sir, I dare say I could find her address. She left us about nine months after Elma. I should esteem it a great favour if you would give me that young lady's address, I said. 
whereupon she unlocked a drawer in her writing table and took therefrom a thick leather-bound book which she consulted for a few minutes at last exclaiming yes here it is lydia morton daughter of sir hamilton morton k c m g whiston grange doncaster and she scribbled it in pencil upon an envelope and handing it to me said elma heath was i fear somewhat neglected by her parents she remained here for five years and had no holidays like the other girls her uncle the baron came to see her several times but on each occasion after he had left i found her crying in secret he was mean and unkind to her now that i recollect i remember that lydia had said she had received a letter from her therefore she might be able to give you some information and with that i took my leave thanking her and returned to london could lydia morton furnish any information if so i might find this girl whose photograph had aroused the irate jealousy of the mysterious unknown the ten o'clock edinburgh express from king's cross next morning took me up to doncaster and hiring a musty old fly at the station i drove three miles out of town on the rotherham road finding whiston grange to be a fine old elizabethan mansion in the centre of a great park with tall old twisted chimneys and beautifully kept gardens when i descended at the door and rang the footman was not aware whether miss lydia was in he looked at me somewhat suspiciously i thought until i gave my card and impressed upon him meaningly that i had come from london purposely to see his young mistress upon a very important matter tell her i said that i wished to see her regarding her friend miss elma heath miss elma heath repeated the man very well sir will you walk this way and then i followed him across the big oak-panelled hall filled with trophies of the chase and arms of the civil wars into a small panelled room on the left the deep-set window with its diamond panes giving out upon the old bowling green and the flower garden beyond presently the door opened and a tall dark-haired girl in white entered with an inquiring expression upon her face as she halted and bowed to me miss lydia morton i believe i commenced and as she replied in the affirmative i went on i have first to apologize for coming to you but miss sotheby the principal of the school at chichester referred me to you for information as to the present whereabouts of miss elma heath who i believe was one of your most intimate friends at school and i added a lie saying i am trying on behalf of an aunt of hers to discover her well responded the girl i have had only one or two letters she's in her uncle's hands i believe and he won't let her write poor girl she dreaded leaving us why ah she would never say she had some deep-rooted terror of her uncle baron oberg who lived in st petersburg and who came over at long intervals to see her but possibly you know the whole story i know nothing i cried eagerly you will be furthering her interests as well as doing me a great personal favour if you will tell me what you know it is very little she answered leaning back against the edge of the table and regarding me seriously poor alma her people treated her very badly indeed they sent her no money and allowed her no holidays and yet she was the sweetest tempered and most patient girl in the whole school well and the story regarding her it was supposed that her people at durham did not exist she explained elma had evidently lived a greater part of her life abroad for she could speak french and italian better than the professor himself and therefore always won the prizes the class revolted and then she did not compete any more yet she never told us of where she had lived when a child she came from durham she said that was all you had a letter from her after the baron came and took her away yes from london she said that she had been to several plays and concerts but did not care for life in town there was too much bustle and noise and study of clothes and what other letters did you receive from her three or four i think they were all from places abroad one was from vienna one was from milan and one from some place with an unpronounceable name in hungary the last 
"'Yes, the last,' I gasped eagerly, interrupting her. "'Well, the last I received only a fortnight ago. "'If you will wait a moment, I will go and get it. "'It was so strange that I haven't destroyed it.' "'And she went out, and I heard by the frou-frou of her skirts "'that she was ascending the stairs. "'After five minutes of breathless anxiety, she rejoined me, "'and handing me the letter to read, said, "'It is not in her handwriting. I wonder why.' The paper was of foreign make, with blue lines ruled in squares, written in a hand that was evidently foreign, for the mistakes in the orthography were many, was the following curious communication. My dear Lydia, perhaps you may never get this letter, the last I shall ever be able to send you. Indeed, I run great risks in sending it. Ah, you do not know the awful disaster that has happened to me, all the terrors and the torches I endure but no one can assist me and i am now looking forward to the time when it will all be over do you recollect our old peaceful days in the garden at chichester i think of them always always and compare that sweet peace of the past with my own terrible sufferings of to-day ah how i wish i might see you again how that i might feel your hand upon my brow and hear your words of hope and encouragement but happiness is now debarred from me, and I am only sinking to the grave under this slow torture of body and soul. This will pass through many hands before it reaches the post. If, however, it ever does get dispatched, and you receive it, will you do me one last favour, a favour to an unfortunate girl who is friendless and helpless, and who will no longer trouble the world? It is this. Take this letter to London, and call upon Mr. Martin Woodruff at 98 Cork Street, Piccadilly. Show him my letter, and tell him from me that through it all I have kept my promise, and that the secret is still safe. He will understand, and also know why I cannot write this with my own hand. If he is abroad, keep it until he returns. It is all I ask of you, Lydia, and I know that if this reaches you, you will not refuse me. You have been my only friend and confidant, but I now bid you farewell, for the unknown beckons me, and from the grave I cannot write. Again, farewell, and for ever. Your loving and affectionate friend, Elma. A very strange letter, is it not? remarked the girl at my side. I can't make it out. You see, there is no address, but the postmark is Russian. She is evidently in Russia in finland i said examining the stamp and making out the post town to be abo but have you been to london and executed this strange commission no we are going up next week i intend to call upon this person named woodruff i made no remark he was i knew abroad but i was glad at having obtained two very important clues first the address of the mysterious yachtsman woodruff alias hornby and secondly, ascertaining that the young girl I sought was somewhere in the vicinity of the town of Abo, the Finnish port on the Baltic. Poor Elma, you see, speaks in her letter of some secret, Mr. Gregg, my companion said. She says she wishes this Mr. Woodruff, whoever he is, to know that she has kept her promise and has not divulged it. This only bears out what I have all along suspected. What are your suspicions? Well, from her deep, thoughtful manner, and from certain remarks she at times made to me, I believe that Elma is in possession of some great and terrible secret, a secret which her uncle, Baron Oberg, is desirous of learning. I know she holds him in deadly fear. She is in terror that she may inadvertently betray to him the truth. End of chapter 8 Chapter Nine of the Czar's Spy by William Lecoeur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange disclosures are made. The strange letter of Elma Heath, combined with what Lydia Morton had told me, aroused within me a determination to investigate the mystery. From the moment I had landed from the Lola on that hot, breathless night at Leghorn, 
Mystery crowded upon mystery until it was all bewildering. It was now proved that the sweet-faced girl, the original of the torn photograph, held a secret, and that, by her own words, she knew that death was approaching. The incomprehensible attempt upon my life, the strange actions of Hornby and Chater, who, by the way, seemed to have entirely disappeared, the assassination of the man who by masquerading as the Italian waiter had met his death, and the murder of Olinto's wife were all problems which required solution. Had it not been for the mystery of it all, and mystery ever arouses the human curiosity, I should have given up trying to get at the truth. Yet, as a man with some leisure, and knowing by that letter of Elma Heath's that she was in sore distress, I redoubled my efforts to ascertain the reason of it all. The mystery of the Lola was still a mystery along the Mediterranean. At every French and Italian port, the yacht's false name and general build was written in the police books, while at Lloyd's the name Lola was marked down as among the mysterious craft at sea. Chater was missing while Hornby was abroad. Perhaps they were both cruising again, were their yacht repainted and bearing a fresh name? But why? What had been their motive? Stirred by the complete mystery which now seemed to enshroud the unfortunate girl, I set before myself the task of elucidating it. Hitherto I had remained passive rather than active, but I now realized by that curious letter that at least one woman's life was at stake, that Elma Heath was in possession of some secret. On leaving Leghorn I had given up all hope of tracing the mysterious yachtsman, and had left the matter in the hands of the Italian police. But without any effort on my own part, I seemed to have been drawn into a veritable network of strange incidents, all of which combined to form the most complete and remarkable enigma ever presented in life. Surely no man was ever confronted by so many mysteries at one time as I was at this moment. Fortunately, I had been careful not to show my hand to anyone, and this perhaps gave me a distinct advantage. On my journey back to London, as the train swung through Peterborough and out across the rich level lands towards Hitchin, I recollected Jack Durnford's words when I had mentioned the Lola. What, I wondered, did he know? Next month, in November, he was due back in London after his three years' service on the Mediterranean station. That we should meet in a few weeks, I hoped. Would he tell me anything when he became aware of all I knew? He held some secret knowledge. Was it possible that his secret was the same as that held by the unfortunate girl in far-off, dreary Finland? I called at the house in Cork Street, indicated by Elma, and learned from the old commissionaire, who acted as lift-man and porter, that Mr. Woodruff's chambers were closed. "'He's nearly always away, sir, abroad, I think,' was all I could get out of the old soldier, who, like his class, was no doubt well paid to keep his mouth closed. For two days I lounged about Westman Grove, watching Ferrari's restaurant. In such a busy, bustling thoroughfare, with so many shop windows as excuses for loitering, the task was easy. I saw that Olinto came regularly at ten o'clock in the morning, worked hard all day, and left at nine o'clock at night, taking an omnibus home from Royal Oak. His exterior was calm and unconcerned, unlike that of a man whose devoted wife had disappeared. I would have approached him and explained the ghastly truth, had it not been for the fact that the poor woman's body was missing. Those September days were full of anxiety for me. Alone and unaided, I was trying to solve one of the greatest problems, plunged as I was in a veritable sea of mystery. I wanted to see Muriel Leithcourt, and to question her further regarding Elma Heath. Therefore, again, I left Euston, and, travelling throughout the night, took my seat at the breakfast-table at Greenlaw next morning. Sir George, who was sitting alone, it not being my aunt's habit to appear early, welcomed me, and then, in his bluff manner, sniffed and exclaimed, "'Nice goings-on up at Rannoch. Have you heard of them?' "'No, what? 
I cried breathlessly, staring at him. Well, my suspicions that those Leithcourts were utter outsiders turns out to be about correct. Why? Well, it's a very funny story, and there are a dozen different distorted versions of it, he said. But from what I can gather, the true facts are these. About seven o'clock the night before last, as Leithcourt and his house party were dressing for dinner, a telegram arrived. Mrs. Leithcourt opened it, and at once went off into hysterics, while her husband, in a breathless hurry, slipped off his evening clothes again, and got into an old blue serge suit, tossed a few things into a bag, and then went along to Muriel's room to urge her to prepare for secret flight. Flight? I gasped. What, have they gone? Listen, and I'll tell you. The servants have described the whole affair down in the village, so there's no doubt about it. Leithcourt showed Muriel the telegram and urged her to fly. At first she refused, but for her father's sake was induced to prepare to accompany him. Of course the guests were in ignorance of all this. The broom was ordered to be ready in the stable-yard and not to go round, while Mrs. Leithcourt's maid tried to bring the lady back to her senses. Leithcourt himself, it seemed, rushed hither and thither, seizing the jewel-cases of his wife and daughter and whatever valuables he could place his hand upon, while the mother and daughter were putting on their things. As he rushed down the main staircase to the library, where his cheque-book and some ready cash were locked in the safe, he met a stranger who had just been admitted and shown into the room. Leithcourt closed the door and faced him. What afterwards transpired, however, is a mystery, for two hours later, after he and the two women had escaped, leaving the house party to their own diversions, the stranger was found locked in a large cupboard and insensible. The sensation was a tremendous one. Cowan, the doctor, was called, and declared that the stranger had been drugged and was suffering from some narcotic. The servant who admitted him declared that the man had said he had an appointment with his master, and that no card was necessary. He, however, gave the name of Chater. Chater, I cried, starting up. Are you certain of that name? I only know what Cowan tells me, was my uncle's reply. But do you know him? Not at all. Only I've heard that name before, I said. I knew a man out in Italy of the same name. But where is the visitor now? In the hospital at Dumfries. They took him there in preference to leaving him alone at Rannoch. Alone? Everyone has left. Now the host and hostess have slipped off without saying good-bye. Scandalous affair, isn't it? But, my boy, you'll remember that I always said I didn't like those people. There's something mysterious about them, I feel certain. That telegram gave them warning of the visit of the man Chater, depend upon it. And for some reason they're afraid of him. It would be interesting to know what transpired between the two men in the library. And these are people who have been taken up by everybody, mere adventurers, I should call them. And old Sir George sniffed again at the thought of such scandal happening in the neighbourhood. If Gilray must let Rannoch, then why in the name of fortune doesn't he let it to respectable folk and not to the first fellow who answers his advertisement in the field? It's simply disgraceful. Certainly it is a most extraordinary story, I declared. Leithcourt evidently wished to escape from his visitor, and that's why he drugged him. Why, he poisoned him, you mean. Cowan says the fellow is poisoned, but that he'll probably recover. He is already conscious, I hear. I resolved to call on the doctor, who happened to be well known to me, and obtain further particulars. Therefore, at eleven o'clock, I drove into Dumfries and entered his consulting-room. He was a spare, short, fair man, a trifle bald, and when I was shown in he welcomed me warmly, speaking with his pronounced Galloway accent. "'Well, it is a very mysterious case, Mr. Gregg,' he said, after I had told him the object of my visit. "'The gentleman is still in the hospital, and I have to keep him very quiet.' He was poisoned without a doubt, and has had a very narrow escape of his life. The police got wind of the affair, and Mackenzie called to question him. 
but he refused to make any statement whatever, apparently treating the affair very lightly. The police, however, are mystified as to the reason of Mr. Leithcourt's sudden flight, and are anxious to get at the bottom of the curious affair. Naturally, and more especially after the tragedy up in Rannoch Wood a short time ago, I said, that's just it said the doctor removing his pince-nez and rubbing them mackenzie seems to suspect some connection between leithcourt's sudden disappearance and that mysterious affair it seems very evident that the telegram was a warning to leithcourt of the man chater's intention of calling and that the last name was shown in just at the moment when the fugitive was on the point of leaving chater i echoed do you know his christian name Hilton Chater. He is apparently a gentleman. Curious that he will tell us nothing of the reason he called, and of the scene that occurred between them. Knowing all that I did, I was not surprised. Leithcourt had undoubtedly taken him unawares, but knights of industry never betray each other. My next visit was to Mackenzie, for whom I had to wait nearly an hour, as he was absent in another quarter of the town ah mr gregg he cried gladly as he came in to find me seated in a chair patiently reading the newspaper you are the very person i wish to see have you heard of this strange affair at rannoch i have was my answer has the man in the hospital made any statement yet none he refuses point blank answered the detective but my own idea is that the affair has a very close connection with the two mysteries of the wood the first mystery that of the man proves to be a double mystery i said how explain it well the waiter olinto santini is alive and well in london what he gasped starting up then he is not the person you identified him to be no but he was masquerading as santini made up to resemble him i mean even to the mole upon his face but you identified him positively when a person is dead it is very easy to mistake countenances death alters the countenance so very much that's true he said reflectively but if the man we buried is not the italian then the mystery is considerably increased why was the real man's wife here and where has her body been concealed that's the question again a mystery we have made a thorough search for four days without discovering any trace of it. Quite confidentially, I'm wondering if this man Chater knows anything. It is curious, to say the least, that the Leithcourt should have fled so hurriedly on this man's appearance. But have you actually seen Olinto Santini? Yes, and have spoken with him. I sent up to London, asking that inquiries should be made at the restaurant in Bayswater, but up to the present I have received no report i have chatted with olinto his wife has mysteriously disappeared but he is in ignorance that she is dead you did not tell him anything nothing ah you did well there is widespread conspiracy here depend upon it mr gregg it will be an interesting case when we get to the bottom of it all i only wish this fellow chater would tell us the reason he called upon leithcourt what does he say merely that he has no wish to prosecute and that he has no statement to make can't you compel him to say something i asked no i can't that's the infernal difficulty of it if he don't choose to speak then we must still remain in ignorance although i feel confident that he knows something of the strange affair up in the wood and although i was silent i shared the scotch detective's belief the afternoon was chill and wet as i climbed the hill to greenlaw the sudden disappearance of the tenants of rannoch was i found on every one's tongue in dumfries in the smoke-room of the railway hotel three men were discussing it with many grimaces and sinister hints and the talkative young woman behind the bar asked me my opinion of the strange goings-on up at the castle as i walked on alone with the dark line of woods crowning the hilltop before me the scene of that double tragedy i again calmly reviewed the situation i longed to go to the hospital and see hilton chater 
yet when i recollected the part he had played with hornby on board the lola i naturally hesitated he was allied with hornby apparently against leithcourt although the latter was hornby's friend what i wondered had transpired in the library of that grey old castle which stood out boldly before me dark and grim as i plodded on through the rain how had leithcourt succeeded in rendering his enemy insensible and hiding him in that cupboard did he believe that he had killed him if i went boldly to chater then it would only be the betrayal of myself no i decided that the man who had smoked and chatted with me so affably on that hot breathless night in the mediterranean must remain in ignorance of my presence or of my knowledge therefore i stayed for a week at greenlaw with eyes and ears ever open yet exercising care that the patient in the hospital should be unaware of my present mackenzie saw him on several occasions but he still persisted in that tantalizing silence the inquiry into the death of the unidentified man in rannoch wood had been resumed and a verdict returned of wilful murder against some person unknown while of the second crime the public had no knowledge for the body was not discovered time after time i searched the wood alone on the pretense of shooting pigeon but discovered nothing when not having sport on my uncle's property i joined various parties in the neighbourhood not because scotland at that time attracted me but because i desired to watch events chater as soon as he recovered left the hospital and went south to london i ascertained leaving the police utterly in the dark and filled with suspicion of the fugitives from rannoch i longed to know the whereabouts of muriel hoping to gain from her some information regarding their visitor who had so nearly escaped with his life that she was aware of the object of his visit was plain from the statements of the servants all of whom had been left without either money or orders one day i called at the castle the front entrance of which i found closed gilray the owner had come up from london met his factor there and discharged all the late tenant servants keeping on only three of his own who had been in service there for a number of years anne cameron a housemaid was one of these and it was she whom i met when entering the servants hall on questioning her i found her most willing to describe how she was in the corridor outside the young mistress's room when mr leithcourt dashed along in breathless haste with a telegram in his hand she heard him cry look at this read it muriel we must go put on your things at once my dear never mind about luggage every minute lost is of consequence what he cried a moment later you won't go you'll stay here stay here and face them good heavens girl are you mad don't you know what this means it means that the secret is out the secret is out you hear we must fly the woman told me that she distinctly heard miss muriel sobbing while her father walked up and down the room speaking rapidly in a low tone then he came out again and returned to his dressing-room while miss muriel presumably changed from her evening gown into a dark travelling dress did she say anything to you i inquired only that they were called away suddenly sir but the domestic added the young lady was very pale and agitated and we all knew that something terrible had happened mrs leithcourt gave orders that nothing was to be told to the guests who dined alone believing that their host and hostess had gone down to the village to see an old man who was dying that was the story we told them sir and in the meantime the leithcourts were in the express going to carlisle yes sir they say in dumfries that the police telegraphed after them but they had reached carlisle and had evidently changed there and so got away by the administration of a judicious tip i was allowed to go up to miss muriel's room an elegantly furnished little chamber in the front of the fine old place with a deep old-fashioned window commanding a magnificent view across the broad nithsdale the room had been tidied by the maids but allowed to remain just as she had left it 
I advanced to the window, in which was set the large dressing-table with its big swing mirror and silver-topped bottles, and on gazing out saw to my surprise it was the only window which gave a view of that corner of Rannoch Wood where the double tragedy had taken place. Indeed, any person standing at the spot would have a clear view of that one distant window while out of sight of all the rest. A light might be placed there at night, as signal, for instance, or by day a towel might be hung from the window, as though to dry, and yet could be plainly seen at that distance. Another object in the room also attracted my attention, a pair of long field glasses. Had she used these to keep watch upon that spot? I took them up and focused them upon the boundary of the wood, finding that I could distinguish everything quite plainly. "'That's where they found the man who was murdered,' explained the servant, who still stood in the doorway. "'I know,' I replied. "'I was just trying the glasses. "'Then I put them down, and on turning saw upon the mantel-shelf "'a small, bright red candle-shade, which I took in my hand. "'It was made, I found, to fit upon the electric table-lamp. "'Miss Muriel was very fond of a red light,' explained the young woman and as I held it I wondered if that light had ever been placed upon the toilet table and the blind drawn up, whether it had ever been used as a warning of danger. As I expressed a desire to see the young lady's boudoir, the maid Cameron took me down to the luxurious little room where, the first moment I entered, one fact struck me as peculiar. The picture of Elma Heath was no longer there. The photograph had been taken from its frame, and in its place was the portrait of a broad-browed, full-bearded man in a foreign military uniform, a picture that, being soiled and faded, had evidently been placed there to fill the empty frame. Whose hand had secured that portrait before Leithcourt's flight? Why, indeed, should I, for the second time, discover the unhappy girl's picture missing? Has the gentleman who called on the evening of Mr. Leithcourt's disappearance been back here again since he left the hospital? I inquired, as a sudden idea occurred to me. Yes, sir, he called here in a fly on the day he came out, and at his request I took him over the castle. He went into the library and spent half an hour in pacing across it, taking measurements and examining the big cupboard in which he was found insensible. "'It was a strange affair, sir,' added the young woman, "'wasn't it?' "'Very,' I replied. "'The gentleman might have been in there now, "'had I not gone into the library "'and found a lot of illustrated papers, "'which I always put in the cupboard "'to keep the place tidy, "'thrown out on the floor. "'I went to put them back, "'but discovered the door locked. "'The key I afterwards found in the grate "'where Mr. Leithcourt had evidently thrown it, and on opening the door, imagine the shock I had when I found the visitor lying doubled up. I, of course, thought he was dead. And when he returned on his recovery, did he question you? Oh, yes. He asked about the Leithcourts and especially about Miss Muriel. I believe he's rather sweet on her by the way he spoke. And really no better or kinder lady never breathed, I'm sure. We're all very sorry for her. "'But she has nothing to do with the affair.' "'Of course not, but she shares in the scandal and disgrace. "'You should have seen the effect of the news upon the guests "'when they knew that the Leithcourts had gone. "'It was a regular pandemonium. "'They ordered the best champagne out of the cellars and drank it. "'The men cleared all the cigar-boxes, "'and the women rummaged in the wardrobes "'until they seemed like a pack of hungry wolves.' "'Everybody went away with their trunks full of the Leithcourt's things. "'They took whatever they could lay their hands on, "'and we, the servants, couldn't stop them. "'I did remonstrate with one lady who was cramming into her trunk two of Miss Muriel's best evening dresses, "'but she told me to mind my own business and leave the room. "'One man I saw go away with four of Mr. Leithcourt's guns.' and there was a regular squabble in the billiard-room over a set of pearl and emerald dress-studs that somebody found in his dressing-room. Crane, the valet, says they tossed for them. Disgraceful, I ejaculated, 
Then, as soon as the host and hostess had gone, they simply swept through the rooms and cleared them? Yes, sir. They took away all that was most valuable. They'd have had the silver, only Mason had thrown it into the plate chest, all dirty as it was, locked it up and hid the key. The plate was Mr. Gilray's, you know, sir, and Mason was responsible. He acted wisely, I said, surprised at the domestic story. Why, the guests acted like a gang of thieves. They were, sir. They rushed all over the house like demons let loose, and they even stole some of our things. I lost a silver chain. And what did the stranger say when you told him of this? He smiled. It did not seem to surprise him in the least, for after all his visit was the cause of the sudden breaking up of the party, wasn't it? And did you show him over the whole house, I inquired? Yes, sir, replied the servant. Curiously enough, he had with him what seemed to be a large plan of the castle, and as we went from room to room he compared it with his plan. He was here for hours, and told me he wanted to make a thorough examination of the place, and didn't want to be disturbed. He said that he might probably take the place for the next season if he liked it. I think, however, he only told me this because he thought I would be more patient while he took his measurements and made his investigations. He was here from twelve till nearly six o'clock, and went through every room, even up to the turrets. He came into this room, I suppose? Yes, sir, she responded, with just a slight hesitation, I thought. This was the room where he stayed the longest. There was a photograph in that frame over there, she added, indicating the frame that had held the picture of Elma Heath a portrait of a young lady which he begged me to give him. "'And you gave it to him?' I cried quickly. "'Well, yes, sir. He begged so hard for it, saying that it was the portrait of a friend of his.' "'And he gave you something handsome for it, eh?' The young woman, whom I knew could not refuse half a sovereign, coloured slightly and smiled. "'And who put that picture in its place?' I asked. "'I did, sir. I found it upstairs.' He didn't tell you who the young lady was, I suppose. No, sir. He only said that that was the only photograph that existed, and that she was dead. Dead? I gasped, staring at her. Yes, sir. That was why he was so anxious for the picture. Elma Heath dead? Could it be true? That sweet-pictured face haunted me as no other face had ever impressed itself upon my memory. It somehow seemed to impel me to endeavour to penetrate the mystery, and yet Hilton Chater had declared that she was dead. I recollected the remarkable letter from Abo, and her own declaration that her end was near. That letter was, she said, the last she should write to her friend. Did Hilton Chater actually possess knowledge of the girl's death? Had he all along been acquainted with her whereabouts? What the young woman told me upset all my plans. If Elma Heath were really dead, then she was beyond discovery, and the truth would be hidden for ever. After he had put the photograph in his pocket, the gentleman made a most minute search in this room, the domestic went on. He consulted his plan, took several measurements, and then tapped on the panelling all along this wall, as though he was searching for some hidden cupboard or hiding place. I looked at the plan, and saw a mark in red ink upon it. He was trying to discover that spot, and was greatly disappointed at not being able to do so. He was in here over an hour, and made a most careful search all around. And what explanation did he give? He only said, If I find what I want, Anne, I shall make you a present of a ten-pound note. That naturally made me anxious. He made no other remark about the young lady's death, I inquired anxiously. No, only he sighed and looked steadily for a long time at the photograph. I saw his lips moving, but his words were inaudible. You haven't any idea of the reason why he called upon Mr. Leithcourt, I suppose. From what he said, I formed my own conclusions, was her answer. And what is your opinion? Well, I feel certain that there is, or was, something concealed in this house that he's very anxious to obtain. He came to demand it of Mr. Leithcourt, but what happened in the library we don't know. 
He, however, believes that Mr. Leithcourt has not taken it away, and that, whatever it may be, it is still hidden here. End of chapter 9